Would you consider yourself more a beat maker or producer or DJ? A lot of you make a lot of beats now. What's your... You do, do everything, huh? Yeah. I don't know, like a lot of the ideas is that a lot of records I got from you is like a lot of like bonus beats and things like that. Pretty much the concept behind that was was to give the DJ that extra version, that extra mix that wasn't available. You know what I mean? Um, that's how I came out to put, you know, start putting out these beat records um, initially, was just to extend certain breaks and give you that. You know, there was no survival. You had to cut that. You had to play that record. You know what I mean? There wasn't nothing looping it for you. You know what I mean? So I was, I used to. That was the concept behind it. Yeah, back in the day we did it live, no computer. That's a question for both of you guys. What do you think about a lot of the new DJs using the laptop a lot? Do you feel it takes away anything from the experience? Because I know sometimes people stay at the laptop so much, it's kind of like you know. Lose the vibe of the people around them. What's, what's your idea on that? With Serato, I don't I don't really think it takes away because you're still you're still putting your hand on some fight. You, know, you still have you still gotta have skills, you know, so I mean on, on that level, no. But just as far as um I guess the digging at the digging aspect of it, you know, you can go you can go online and find anything. It's just technology is making everything a little bit easier now. But you know, like when I watch Jazzy Jeff, you know, on the Serato, you know, he, he's, it's like you can't tell, really. You know, it's, it's still, it's still based on skills. But then the, the crazy thing is, you, you'll be in a club and there's somebody, the DJ before you, is pushing the buttons and moving faders up and down, and everything's mixed. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and it's crazy, and the, and the crowd is, they know. You know what I'm saying? They're like, Ken, when are you getting on? We can't take this no more. You know, because it's just like, everything's real flat, you know, and, and just even, because everything's done already. Right. You know what I'm saying? There's no vibe. It's pretty much the, the, the mix is done. So there's no interaction with the crowd or the people, seeing what they like, what they don't like, if they're dancing, if they're not dancing. You know what I'm saying? So, in one side of it, yeah, people like Jeff who put in work. But then there's also people who just take it easy. You know what I'm saying? And then also there's, you know, on the club side, there's promoters that are booking DJs, $200 or 200 euros. They got a computer, they got music, and they just push them up. You know what I'm saying? So then they get somebody like us comes and does work and they're like, they totally forgot, they're like removed of what a DJ does. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's two sides. So a question for Kenny and Diamond. In your opinion, why do you think hip hop has changed so much over the years? Because hip hop is not what it used to be. Now it's, the lyrics have changed. It's very commercial. Corporates have taken over. What's your take on that? There's still an underground. You know what I'm saying? There's still an underground hip hop. It's still out there. You got your Madlibs, you got your Scott Blues, you got, there's so many MCs out there doing their thing still. Main, now we're talking mainstream hip hop. What's on like Hot 97 and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I feel you, it's, it's watered down. It's the same 10 hours on, you know, but the, the nature of the business has changed hip hop. The sample clearances are retarded. And when I say retarded, it's like, just because it's a certain artist, you know, the, the publishing company wants to charge 60,000 for a sample, it's, it's, it's changed. It changed the way you think, it changed the way a lot of producers make records because, you know, um, perfect example is um, Lord Tariq and Peter Gunners. Like, them dudes basically got put out of business because Stevie Dan just came, and just came and said, look, that's my new, I'm taking 100% of the song, and they put them out of business. So, in that aspect, there's people that they kind of want to make beats in that era, but they're kind of cautious about the business side of it. You know what I mean? Um, 
like when I did Raheem Devon's album, I did 11 songs on that, and I sampled the Isaac Cage record, they took 66% of the song. So there was 33 left to split between everybody else. You know what I mean? And, you know, Ludacris was on that. So it's like he took 16, so it's like, you know, what was left? You know what I mean? So, but for the art of it, I love it. You know what I mean? It's got a certain sound. You can't, it is what it is. I, I, I it got an album coming out with my MC. His name is Rashid Chappelle. Every record's a sample. There's scratch hooks in it. I don't care. I'm going for it. It's the sound, and we're trying to bring that back. I want to touch on what Kenny said. Um, he said, uh, he said Isaac, Isaac Hayes, yeah, he had to Okay, but yeah, but the thing to remember is even and, and even though that's a, that, that's a lot, that's that's a big percentage. But the difference between um, that scenario and Guns and Tariq, um, Guns and Tariq just put the song out and the shit just took a took a life of its own. They did it quick, and once you do that, um, you know more or less the artist has the upper hand. They can basically say, you know, you. Either you're gonna give me this or you're gonna just pull everything off the shelves, you know, around the world. And I don't think Sony wanted to do that. So that's why, you know, if, if you are sampling on a on a major label, um, you need to just try to clear it before you put it out. You know, it's like it's like a double-edged sword. You don't wanna like if you want a budget, you don't wanna pay um, a couple of stacks and then the record doesn't do nothing. But if, if, if you don't clear it and you put it out and it takes off, you don't want to pay more on the end. So basically, touching on the same subject, when I did the Buckheads record, I sampled Chicago. We put out the 12 inch. From one week to the next, it sold 15,000. The second week, on 12 inches now, we're talking, you know, 95. The second week, it sold another 15,000. I was up to 30,000 in two weeks. We're like, whoa, this one is moving too fast. The third week, we was at 60,000. It was time to clear the record, what he just said. Now, that sample cost me $35,000 to clear it, but I ended up with 33% of the song, which I mean, a lot of money to this day because the record's still being played. It's still in the, in, in, you know, in the, in, the, in the basketball games and all that kind of stuff, but I, I had to clear the record. It was a choice to make, either get sued, or get it stopped, or you know, clear it. And they and Chicago was happy. And to find out, Chicago didn't even write the record. It was Rufus and Shaka Khan's people who who wrote their song, and that was the original Rufus and Shaka. So it's like one one step to the next step to the next step. But we ended up clearing it, and you know, it's it is what it is, you know. So the record, as it progressed and sold so many, it was. You, they didn't know about this yet? Like you took the initiative to go, man, I gotta fix this, this is gonna cost me. Yeah, because Atlantic Records wanted the record. So I was like, we gotta clear it, you know what I mean? And it, it was just something, it was a call I made, because it, it moved too fast in three weeks. We sold a lot of records in three weeks, plus we made the money to clear the record anyway. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was the 12 inches we sold, we made the money. So it was just like, let's just clear it, let's just take this, and when they came back, they were like 35 grand. I was like, God, damn. you yes. know, this is like, you know, we're talking 1995 now. So, yeah. but at that period, a, a lot of the, the rap groups and producers were going through the same thing. You know, that to, to this day, if you know, if you look for De La Soul records on iTunes, it, there ain't many because none of the samples are clear. Right. All the records that ain't on iTunes that you look for, it's because yes. there ain't no samples clear. You know what I mean? So right. that's the deal with that. And a lot, most of the music at that time was a sample-based sound for hip hop. Compared to now, like you said, there's no, they don't even deal with it. They just make these records, and that's that. Nah, but, but like I said before too, there is a lot of groups from LA doing it, from Detroit, doing oh, yeah. it underground, underground. You know what I mean? They're doing it. They're chopping up a lot of stuff, a lot more. Yeah. You know, like when JD was doing all his stuff, and, and it just kind of disguised it. You know, yeah. but it's, it's still going on. But the, the mainstream hip hop is what we're talking about. Right. It's very different from what they were doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? 
Great. So should we go audience questions? Yeah, let's do some Q&A. I think he's, he has a question. Dutch. On the table tip, like you mentioned JD, you know, Madeline, Bill Mine. If you take a standpoint, I mean, you really flip it to where you can't really recognize, you say, you know, fragments. Can you still get, like, slammed with, you know, a big bill? I mean, I know you got to sell a lot to really get recognized. Let me tell you something. If you stay away from one label, Tough City Records, <laughs> all right? That dude will, 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 will sue you for a snare drum, okay? He owns a piece of president. He owns Cash to Beat. He owns a lot of stuff. His whole mentality behind it, he's basically looking for records to sue people and building his catalog, you know what I'm saying? But when you're, to answer your question about the, the chopping and all that kind of stuff, if you disguise it, you, yeah, if you make it yours, then you, yeah, nobody's gonna know. But if it's if it's one of those chords that is recognizable, they'll get you for it. If they could, if they could prove it, you know what I'm saying? It's like a new business, suing. Yeah. It's a business. It's been a business, it's been a business. more about technology for the both of you. You both came up at a time when there's no, we, you know, you talk about as far as DJ goes, but I want to talk about more production. Um, you came up at a time when there was no Ableton, so you could take a sample of the wind with it, you know. You came up at a time when there's no sound forge or cakewalk or any of it, you know, Pro Tools, whatever. What were some of your first introductions into, into the production technology side of, of making music for both of you? I used an SB1200 and an S950. That was my first rig and a four track Tascam 34. That was it. You know what I'm saying? Um, before that, we had a four track cassette. So we come from the school of actually putting things together manually. Um, so now when you, when you get this technology, it's like you kind of get mad the music that's being made today with the technology of what these kids have and they're making this, I don't want to say it, but you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, wow, you know, we came from here and we did this and this is what we did and this is what they're doing with all, with everything. You know, soft sense, you could get any kind of keyboard sound you were looking for. You know what I'm saying? You got programs like you just said, like the Ableton and, and that stuff, that chop stuff on the fly. You could cut a drum beat up and put it on beat in two seconds and then loop it. You know what? I have friends like Lord Finesse who will use Ableton and it makes his job easier. You know what I'm saying? We stood hours trying to put things in, in line and in sync and all that kind of stuff by hand. Use the program, dump it back to the drum sheet still. You know what I'm saying? And then do your beat. Um, but yeah, it's just. It, Continue with that. I can keep going. But yeah.